before the times of full 3D graphics and expansive physics engines, seen in games like Half-Life and Crisis, computers were restricted to simple 2D graphics, consisting of vector or sprite-based art. One example of these early video games is Rogue. Rogue's art style uses ASCII graphics, which is a fixed character set locked to a grid. Games with this medium of interaction were especially popular with command line based operating systems and machines, as the architecture for displaying grid based characters is already present. As well as this minimalistic art style, Rogue uses procedural generation. Procedural generation is a method of level creation used in early and modern video games to create the environment of a game using a seed on runtime to calculate how the level will be laid out. This method of level creation greatly reduces the amount of memory the game uses on the disc, since it is using maths instead of predefined and stored levels. It goes without saying how important methods like these were to save space on early computers, and thus why this technique was so prevalent at the time. Rogue also had other defining aspects other than its level generation and ASCII graphics. It was the game that kickstarted a whole new genre in video games, roguelikes. Roguelikes are games that, quite simply put, are similar to the 1980s game, Rogue. The Berlin interpretation for roguelikes can be broken down into a list of high and low value factors, which are rough guidelines to determine if a game is indeed like Rogue. The high value factors include permadeath, meaning the player must restart upon their death, turn-based movement systems, meaning actions are not time-based and only occur once the player has decided to take their turn, procedural generation, which was previously explained, and is a mathematical rule set used in dungeon generation. Grid-based gameplay, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with the ASCII art style seen in Rogue. Resource management, consisting of a limited resource and items which should be used over the course of the game. And finally, exploration. The player should not know the map layout before it is being visited. The need for these rules are important as we explore how the Binding of Isaac breaks, and in doing so, improves upon many of these rules to create a much more fulfilling and fun gameplay loop. These changes open the genre to a much wider audience, thanks to the removal of the tedium and the outdated elements classic roguelikes tend not to stray far from. In fact, The Binding of Isaac has changed the formula so much, some tend to reclassify the game as a subgenre by the name of Rogue Light, a genre which is often credited to the release of The Binding of Isaac in 2011 and the sequel, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth, in 2014. The most striking difference between roguelikes and Isaac are the graphics. The Binding of Isaac uses vector-based graphics, which is a graphical method consisting of 2D points on the X and Y axis connected by lines. This stylistic choice violates one of the low-value factors defined in the Berlin interpretation, that being the ASCII display. Not adhering to the Berlin definition in this case greatly benefits Isaac, as it carves out its own unique art style and allows for the use of animations, particle effects, and a more detailed real-time physics engine. Physics also being in violation of a high value factor of the Berlin definition, that being turn-based movement and combat. Turn-based systems do have their place in other games like Civilization, XCOM, Roguelikes, and other strategy-oriented games, where each decision requires careful thought and planning. Isaac, however, adopts for a more active and fast-paced gameplay loop, which lends itself to a wider audience. Unlike many roguelikes, which can become mind-numbingly boring for many due to the uninspired combat system and grid-based movement. Many roguelites to come further expand on this fast-paced style of combat, such as Enter the Gungeon and Nuclear Throne, which are quite obviously more or less influenced by Isaac, but opt for a more hectic and faster-paced run-and-gun style of gameplay. This change is one of the major ways Isaac was able to allow for the popularization of the genre. Procedural generation in The Binding of Isaac is done very differently to how most roguelikes have implemented the technique. Isaac uses predefined rooms consisting of rocks, pits, traps, and other objects, and randomly generates a floor which links these rooms together, as well as a boss room and an item room. This method of procedural generation has many positive aspects over the completely random room structure roguelikes like Angband have. Namely, a more curated experience for each room, allowing the developers to create rooms specifically designed to elicit emotions and reactions, such as claustrophobia when the room space is greatly reduced, or hesitation and problem solving when the room is full of traps. Uniquely blending procedural generation with pre-built designs and strict rules for the location of items and bosses 
excellently executes the balance between a curated game experience and a new journey on each retry, allowing Isaac to remain fresh for potentially hundreds of hours. The procedural aspects also extend to the excellent item and consumable system Isaac employs. Many older classical roguelikes contain items and weapons which may have differing stats, but usually stick to a rigorous spreadsheet style of bonuses. Isaac, however, opts for more creative stylistic choices for items, which can, and often will, radically change the pace, tactics, and decisions you make over the course of the run. Radical changes in the player's shots, which are actually the player's tiers, can be seen upon pickup for certain items. For example, Anti-Gravity gives you a shot speed increase, but does not move your tiers until you release the shoot button. Brimstone creates a large laser barrage, which travels through enemies. Hemolacria turns your tears into a large red ball, which explodes on contact with the ground. These tear effects are all quite interesting by themselves, but Isaac moulds these effects together in the form of synergies. Synergies in Isaac are amazingly plentiful due to the wide variety of items, a total of 463 including DLC, with perhaps thousands of useful combinations. These items can also, however, work against each other. For example, the item My Reflection curves your shots back towards you, and the item Ipecac makes your shots explosive. Together, these items are dangerous, and will make you deal damage to yourself. Item interactions like these are precisely why the game has so much replay value. Synergies on new runs are often unique, interesting, and effectively will change the way you tackle problems. I personally have over 400 hours in the game, and I'm discovering new things every time I play. These colourful interactions between items in Isaac are in stark contrast with more bland items restricted to simple status buffs seen in many older roguelikes. Isaac's influence has been such that other roguelites, namely Into the Gungeon, have gone the extra mile in adding an additional surplus of synergies on top of their natural item synergies in the form of hard-coded interactions. These are usually referencing some form of pop culture or joke and are an example of how the synergy system Isaac uses is fantastic, but can nevertheless be improved upon. Synergies and procedural generation, however, are not the only reasons for Isaac's replay value. The game sets itself up as a series of challenges from the word go. Each challenge more difficult than the last, the game is presented in a staggered format, where certain bosses must be beaten and certain tasks completed in order to proceed in your next run. You are also constantly being rewarded with new content, be it unlockable items, unlockable new characters with different abilities, unlockable challenges, and even unlockable endings to the story. Isaac offers a slow drip of content, which makes for an addictive experience that encourages players to return and try again. Other games may attempt this, but fail to capture the importance of novelty and discovery. Every time I pick up a new item in Isaac, it leaves me wondering what it will do, and how it can help my run, which in turn brings me to think of items that would synergize well with it, and how I should proceed to optimize my chances of gaining them. A lower quality game will give you items that do one thing and one thing only, and will hold no alternate or secret uses for the player to discover, as well as no synergies possible with other items. This creates a static game structure, with perhaps simple variations on obtained items, with little to no interaction between them. This being in contrast with the complex network of possibilities Isaac allows for, where each item and decision creates a unique experience for the user, allowing for hundreds of hours of replayability. All roguelites, and perhaps even some non-roguelites, should consider how Isaac creates enjoyment for the user in replayability. The game offers a new experience on each playthrough, and sets up an addictive reward loop in the form of short, medium, and long-term goals. We can see Isaac's influence in most modern roguelites. A good roguelite will build off of Isaac's strengths and attempt to diminish its weaknesses. A bad roguelite will use random map generation as a method of avoiding putting work into level design and creativity. An interesting one, however, knows how to use these methods to mold an experience for the user which feels pre-crafted by the game designer, and not a grid of rooms glued onto a spreadsheet of statistics.